blame them and hold them responsible and you don't take responsibility, that's the others. That's your relationship with others. That's your new relationship with others around you and then you lose meaning. And you become nihilistic. And then the suffering in your life no longer becomes worthwhile and you're more likely to not find it worthwhile and become apathetic and nihilistic and possibly suicidal. The relationship things between these things make sense? Now what I want to do here is establish what our aim should be as Christians. Out of Ephesians 4. We're going to use Ephesians 4, and the Ephesians 4 is going to set the model for what we're going to do in the Bible study moving forward, the methodology of it. And this is not to... You're not, you're not going to find what I'm going to say in any commentary or any seminary or any church. All right? And I got a, I got a lot of truck cram in the next couple minutes to try to do this introductory thing. Paul is in Ephesians 4. He spends the first three chapters of Ephesians talking about people's identity in Christ. Um, you're in, in the, the theme really of Ephesians chapter 1 is in Christ, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. Starting in chapter 4, he shifts over. I therefore. And the therefore means because of everything I told you in chapters 1, 2, and 3. And 3, he really gets into getting a deeper understanding of things. I'm praying, he says, I'm praying for you guys. I want you to be strengthened by the inner man because I want you to comprehend something. I need you to have something that passes knowledge. I need you to have fruitful understanding. And he prays something similar, I think, in the end of chapter 2. We'll talk about this build up, built up together the holy habitation. We'll talk about that too in a second. But in chapter 4, therefore, because of all this, I want you to do something. I want you to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. Now, most of the time you hear the word walk, you think of uh, the, your behavior, right? But there's something missing there. Walk is a means of conveyance back then. So imagine in 2020 that I say, all right, I therefore I beseech you to drive worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. It's probably the first question. Where? Right? Where? Where are we going? That's where the aim comes in. So, Paul says, I'm pressing toward the mark. So when he says walk, it's not just the way you behave, it's the way you behave in relation to where you are headed. Right? In, in typical American Christianity, Christianity is presented as a set of rules of do's and don'ts you have to live this holy life. But what I think is actually presented in the New Testament. I say I think because everything that I say is obviously my opinion, and you can throw it in the trash can if you want. But I think what we have presented in the New Testament is we have a spirit of the law, not the letter of the law. And like Jesus said, um, Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. In other words, we don't want to turn around and have our, we don't want to become a slave to the rules that we've created to help serve us. So in AIM, say you're uh, say you're out here, the spirit of the law is like, it's like a commander's intent. The commander's intent in an operations order is going to say, hey, I want you to take out the bumper at the top of the hill. And, he's, and, and the specifics would be go up the left side of the hill. Well, when you try to go up the left side of the hill, you lose first platoon, right? <laughs> so you're like, well... Maybe we're not going to go up the left side of the hill. We're supposed to take out the bunker, but maybe we're going to go up the right side of the hill. Right? So I've changed how I do things, but I'm still going toward the goal. So the New Testament is all about that. I no longer have an, a country with borders language, like Israel, borders language and culture. I can give them a bunch of civil laws that are also religious laws, and they go together. Well, now I'm going to take a group of people. They're going to be in every country in the world. I can't do that anymore. I can't give them all civil laws because they're going to be in different countries that have different civil laws. All right? 
right? So I, I can't do that. I have to do something else. So I have to, I'm going to give them a spirit, which is an influence to do something. And that influence drives you toward a mark, drives you toward an aim. So that when you get off aim, you use discernment. Those who, by the use of discernment, have exercised their skills to discern both good and evil. That's in Hebrews chapter 5. Discernment is a skill, not just a gift. I'm going to use discernment to determine whether my choice gets me closer to or further from my aim. Right? And the spirit of the law is really helpful because sometimes you have two good things that you have to choose between. Something very near and dear to my heart. So you have two good things, then you can't have them both. For example, you can either stay married or you can be truthful, but you can't do both. <laughs> That's a tough situation to be in. What the New Testament is designed to do is designed to act like a lensatic compass and help you, well, which one of these options is going to get me here? And that's how you make your choice. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 20, 22, somewhere around there says, Prove all things, test all things, hold fast that which is good. Because then in the New Testament, God knows that you are going to encounter all kinds of situations that you cannot possibly have covered in a book that only has 788,257 words in it. You know, you can't possibly be exhausted of everybody's scenario, everybody's situation. So I need the New Testament is more like a set of heuristics for how to live a life and still reach an aim, rather than just follow all these rules. Now there are some things. But like I just presented a second ago, sometimes you can't do two good things. You have to choose one. How do you choose? You know, that's what that's what it's about. So we're walking worthy of the Lord wherewith we are called. Uh, we're going to 730, right? Yes. Alright, I'm gonna try to I'm gonna try to get this out. As you keep going through the chapter you come across something very familiar to us. And now what I'm talking about now is the aim of modern Christianity and where I think it should be according to Ephesians 4 and what we're going to be trying to do in this Bible study. Move this chair. I'm sick of the video. Well, I probably want the chair in the way, actually. Because I just saw how big my belly is in the video. <laughs> we're familiar with the concept of apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. Now, <laughs> Here's the, the funny thing is, and I don't want to disrespect anybody's tradition, but when you start with pastors and teachers in 2020, the, the further back you go in this list of people, if you have a church that has apostles, the further back you go in this list, the more hype-based that denomination tends to be, <laughs> you know? If you, if you meet somebody who says, hey, I'm Pastor so-and-so, good chance he's probably a level-headed guy, all right? If he says, I'm Apostle so-and-so, that's an exciting church service. and probably not, not a lot of meat in it. <laughs> it's, I'm just giving you the trends, all right? Trend analysis here. I don't think I've ever heard anybody call himself an Apostle. Oh, yeah. They're out there. I've, I've seen it on church signs. So, I mean, anybody, anybody from a... Uh, a lot of your charismatic churches, they have they have apostles. You know, just the plan is calls himself apostle. The uh, leader of the Mormon Church is supposed to be an apostle. The the holy holiness one is Pentecostal apostolic church. They believe in apostolic succession. Catholics believe that the Pope is an apostle. So yeah, it's pretty. Yeah. Anyway, so now watch this. No, but these are these are scriptural though. We'll get in that right. So we have apostles in the Bible. These are people commissioned by Jesus Christ to carry forth, be witnesses of him. We have prophets, people who speak on behalf of God, often associated with speaking future things on behalf of God, but not necessarily always future things. We have evangelists. That's somebody who is communicating the gospel from saved people to lost people. And then we have pastors and teachers. And we notice that um, pastors and teachers, what a lot of the scholars tell us is that this concept goes together. A pastor leads sheep to greener pastures and teachers teach. The idea is that the pastor teacher is one thing, not pastors and teachers, but pastor teacher kind of thing. So you'll hear people say pastor teacher. And their job, look at their job, is for the perfecting of the saints, 
And so what you want to imagine here, and this, is, this will be important in a second, but I'll stop boring you with the details. You have a pastor teacher, right? And then you have a congregation. And these people are edifying them. Does that make sense? Edifying them. I'm going to ask you, like, who's doing the perfecting and edifying and ministering? Those people in verse 11. Right? It's just subject verb agreement, basic grammar, that's what I'm looking at. Because I'm going to ask you that question again in a second. And the answer should change. For the edifying of the body of Christ, these people are doing that. Now, look at this word here. Till. <laughs> um, to me, that indicates a shift. Who's edifying the body here? These guys. Till something. Which means that whenever, what he's about to talk about next, till that happens, this is going to stop. When that happens, this is going to stop or change or something. You see that? Yeah. All right, so I'm not smoking crack here. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So let me pause right there. Could I say that if we could achieve this, does it sound like to you that these guys are possibly no longer doing this function because they're not needed anymore because we've crossed this phase line? Does that make sense? Yeah. That's what, so what this would be, as the body of Christ, that is our aim. Does that make sense? So if I'm a pastor of a church, if I'm an overseer, my goal is to get the congregation to that. Now, we're, we're told in the very next few verses what it looks like. In, in other words, I need to get to the congregation. If I'm a pastor, I need to get the congregation to the point in time where they no longer need me to teach them. And then we're going to look at, we're going to look at how the edification should be taking place in just a second. Verse 14, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro. Now, the word... This version of the Bible was produced in 1611. The word naive did not get invented until 1650s, I think. So it wasn't available to choose then. And I don't, I don't know what the new versions say there. But I think the concept we have here is naivety. If that, if that passes the smell test. So that we no longer be naive, no longer be children. Tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, and I want to talk about wind of doctrine in a second, if I have enough time, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. So we don't want this to happen anymore. And as long as we have pastors and teachers, evangelists and apostles doing the teaching, this is a risk because we're still children that need them, right? And that thing to go away. All right. But. Speaking the truth in love. Who is speaking the truth in love? We? We all. That's who's speaking the truth in love. May grow, now no longer, what that means is that it's no longer just these guys speaking the truth in love, but we all are now speaking the truth in love. Okay? May grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Grow up into what? This perfect man is the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ. As a group, we should be growing up into that. How do we get there? We speak the truth in love. Trevor? From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which just some of the joints supply. Only the pastors and teachers are now supplying edification, right? No. Every joint, every joint supplier. According to the effectual working of the measure of every part, make it the increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Who's doing the edifying here? We all. Everybody, lottie body. Everybody's doing the edifying here. Up here, just these guys are doing the edifying. They're supposed to be, and I, this is something I think Christi modern Christianity has missed. So 
the world of epistemology and politics and everything is about to move into something in probably the next couple of decades, um, decentralized collective intelligence. And that's how all of epistemology is going to be done. The Bible has the model for decentralized collective intelligence already laid out in Ephesians 4. And we Christians, because we value tradition so much and not the Bible, we have missed this. Then what is decentralized collective intelligence? It's the, it's the idea that all of our intelligence together is greater than some of the parts. For example, you can't go to Boeing and ask any one person to build an airplane. You have to have all of them together. And together, they can produce this amazing marvel, which uh, is pretty amazing. So in Christianity, I think there is a level of aim achieving that we can get to if we can actually aim for this transition that comes after that word till, to where instead of having pastors and teachers and evangelists, we actually transition into the point where everybody is supplying edification to everybody else. That's the goal. That's what we want to aim for. <laughs> As you can imagine, a lot can go wrong with that because there are a lot of people who want to say things that have, they have no business saying. And so then we can get into, and we will, as we go through these series, these studies, we can get into the idea of the person who participates in that, what, what are they like? What are their values? What do they know? How do they interact? Have they transcended their ego? Do they, you know, this concept that people, we tend to present ideas that are other people's ideas, that aren't our ideas. We can't have people doing that. You know, you heard Brother Melton say something, so then you say it. Because it sounded good, and everybody said amen, so now you just start repeating it. Well, that's not really your idea. And you didn't test that out. You didn't weigh it against Scripture. You're just repeating something. We can't do that. Right? The, the, you see where I'm going? We can't. And we can't um, be subject to in-group pressure. And we can't have ranking needs, like I need to come across as sounding better than you. We can't have in-group belonging needs because then we'll be biased by whether or not we think the group will accept us. We have to have people who genuinely understand the content and genuinely can say what their perspective is on it. Look, I am feeling a tree trunk over here, you know, with the elk. They have to be able to say that and be accepted. And then all the other people have to be able to listen to what that person says. And there's a lot of noise that comes with it. For example, I, I know that's not a tree trunk, but I don't know what it is, but I'm going to try to listen what else could a description of a tree trunk be. So I'm going to try to listen to what people say and thread out the signal from the noise. And then once I get a hold of that signal, I'm going to try to re-articulate that signal um, with as much skill and fidelity as I can, and I'm going to mess it up too. It's going to be wrong, it's, it might even be cringeworthy, but then you are going to hear what I re-articulate, and you're going to refine it even further, and then you're going to do it, and then by the time it gets back to me, it's going to be even better, and then I can do it again. So we're going to have like a, like a self-filtering positive feedback loop. Imagine a thousand Christians all doing that well. Well, you know, with nobody egoically presenting things that they think. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Imagine what we could accomplish as Christianity, everybody doing If we could actually move into this, every joint supply, if we could move into what that looks like. Um, I'm going to hit, we got two minutes, I'm going to hit try to hit two things real quick. It, as you keep going through here, you're going to find corrupt communication. That's uh, what I was just explaining to you, things that pollute the information ecology. You're just repeating things that aren't true. But we want to edify. So everybody has to be participating in the edifying process. And then there is this issue of resentment. And if you are resentful, you tend... I'm going to say something about doctrine in a second, too, and then we'll be done. But if you're resentful, you tend to 